Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now today we're gonna to answer that burning question. What is faster aerodynamically, a rim brake bike or a disc brake bike? Well, unfortunately, I don't really have two bikes in the same size of the same make and of the same stack and reach to do this test. Oh wait, hang on a minute, I do. I've got two in the back of the car here. I've got two giant TCR, so let's get them out and have a look at the setup. They are slightly different model years. They're both XL TCRs, so this is the previous kind of model year iteration, and the one on the right is the later one, but more or less, they're virtually the same. But let's just discuss a few practical differences there are on both bikes before we start the testing. Now, the main thing is the stack and reach on both bikes, so the cockpit and the saddle and everything is in exactly the same position. Obviously, in this shot here, you can see three different power meters, but don't worry, I'm gonna use the Faveros for both, so I'll be swapping the pedals. I'm gonna do the testing in ABAB fashion, so kind of cancel out any fatigue or weather changes that might happen. It's pretty stable today. I do expect the runs to be quite slow because we've got pretty much the worst conditions possible today for going fast because it's very cold and it's very dry. Thanks for all the patrons again for helping me fund the purchases of the control tire for all these aero tests. So the disc brake bike requires a different wheel set. This is the Windspace D45, which is 45mm on the front. And this is a slightly deeper rim, the Fastports Von 2, one of my favourite rim brake wheels, very, very stiff. They've both got carbon spokes, but what's important for this test is the internal width of both these rims is almost identical. So it gives the tyre pretty much the same footprint, the same volume and should mean that the rolling resistance figures for both tests are pretty much identical. Obviously this one is slightly deeper so I'd expect it to be slightly faster but we'll see. Um, obviously got the aero handlebar on the rim brake bike so that's going to maybe make that a little bit quicker but on this one we have actually one size narrower handlebar and that could put all the other differences into insignificance so that'd be really interesting to see. I haven't really got any bias towards this test. I don't really know or care what's fastest. Like when the season comes around, I do quite a lot of road bike TTs, club TTs, and I do use the road bike for those, and which I can base the rest of the winter testing on to kind of optimize. Main things, same stack and reach to the millimeter, and I've verified that with a tape measure. You know, it's my bike fit. Another thing on the disc brake TCR, I've got a nice neat DI2 setup with only two two basically cables coming out the bar. One is the front brake hose, and the other one is the DI2 and the rear brake hose. And on the rim brake bike, I've still got block and tackle. Good old block and tackle. So there's a few more exposed cables on that. Is it going to slow it down? Let's do the testing. I'm going to do AB, AB to kind of cancel out any fatigue results in my body or possibly any weather changes that might happen during the test. I don't expect it. It's very still. It's very cold. So the times are going to be pretty slow for the power I'm putting out. I'm going to ride at about 36, 37 kilometers an hour um, on a flat course, dead straight, out and back. So that's the first rim brake run done, but I've just swapped over the Asiomas for the first disc brake run and got the sensor mounted up and also the pink bottle of test. Keeping everything the same. Right then, that's all laps complete. Just waiting for the data to sync. We stick everything back in the car. That was the final run of the B. The sky is beginning to bruise and we should be forced to camp. It feels like it's getting more dense. It's definitely got colder. It's getting more soupy. So for the same power, I feel like I'm going a tiny, tiny bit slower. And you might think that's crazy that I can feel that, but I've done so many of these now on this specific course. Barometrics and temperature sensors and everything should deal with that when calculating the CDA. So, you know, it gets colder, but it is worth doing it on the same day because of the road surface. You can see the road surface is slightly damp. If I did a damp versus dry road surface, the CRR might change a little bit. So I can't tell what's fastest yet because I haven't synced the data, but I couldn't tell the difference. Putting money on it now? Don't know. Quick look at the results summary. Now you might be wanting me to destroy disc brake bikes and say they're draggy, should never have been invented, and rim brakes are faster all round. Well, unfortunately, my test just doesn't show that. But before we get into it, let's have a quick look at this chart because it is a little bit complicated. I'll just explain. CDA is marked on this primary vertical axis on the left. The run or lap number is along the bottom on the x-axis and you can see I've done 10 laps on each bike. So that's 20 kilometers on each bike, 40 kilometers for this whole test in total. It did take a bit of time. And up on the right hand side, we've got average lap yaw. So for each test number, there's an associated average yaw angle, which is signified by the dotted line 
the pink one is the disc and the yellow one is the rim. Now we can see the rim brake bike actually had higher average yaw angles throughout the test, but there's nothing I can do about that. It's just coincidental. It is outside after all, but I did test in the ABAB regime to try and mitigate that. And it is important just to note that your CDA or your coefficient of drag will actually change kind of regime depending on the angle. I think the max angle difference between these two runs is about two degrees, so I'm not too worried about that. And also we can see on this graph, I've got the error bars plotted for each CDA summary for the rim and the disc. Now we can see the error bars for the first kind of four data points are bigger than the actual gap between the rim and the disc brake bike. The error bar is about 0 0.002 meters squared in terms of CDA. So that's pretty damn tiny. That's about one and a half watts at 35 Ks an hour. And we can just basically decipher no difference between these two bikes at those speeds. And, th and that trend is quite consistent. On some of the other data points, the disc brake bike actually tested a little bit faster. But could you say that disc brake bike is definitely faster on this test? I don't think so. Just to put this into perspective, when I do the wheel aero testing on the disc brake bike, so I do all the wheel testing on the disc brake bike because when the brands send me wheels, more often than not, they are disc brake wheels. I've had much bigger differences in terms of CDA between two wheel sets than I have on this test between these two bikes. So component wise, whatever you might say, these two bikes are pretty much identical in terms of CDA. Why is that? Do I expect the disc brake bike to be a bit more draggy? Probably yes at the front end, but there are a few things on the disc brake bike that could mitigate those losses. One is the front end cabling. There's a lot more kind of hidden cables on the DI2 bike, which is a disc brake bike. The rim brake bike is a bit more messy at the front. We've got a few more cables. However, the rim brake bike does have the aero bar, which we tested in that video to be about four watts faster at this test speed. But that said, that aero bar is slightly wider than the bar I have on my disc brake bike by about 15 millimeters. Even though they're both stated to be 40 centimeter bars, actual printed on the bars, when I've measured it, the disc brake bike does put my arms slightly narrower, it brings my elbows in a little bit more and maybe shrugs my shoulders a bit more. So what I'm trying to say is that body position will mitigate any of those losses you might get from small component choices on the bike. It's all about body positions. Just dipping my head on one of these tests or slightly moving my elbows in will put any of these kind of component choices on the bike into insignificance. Given the kind of practical means I've got of having two different bikes, they are not exactly the same. Obviously, the wheels are slightly different as well. But having said that, the tires and the volume and the pressures in the tires were exactly the same to keep you know the rolling resistance the same through this test. There doesn't appear to be much of a CDA difference between the two. Now, putting those tiny differences of CDA into context, I think the average CDA difference is about 0 0.002. What does that mean in terms of the wattage difference at 35 k's an hour? Well, the test speed was actually about 35 and a half k's an hour on average. And the error watts required to produce that 35 k's an hour well, it was about one and a half watts quicker on the disc brake bike. I can't really say for sure that the disc brake bike was quicker. And if it was quicker, I'm putting it down to those handlebars. Now, to get a better resolution of data, you might say, well, why didn't you test this at 45, 50 Ks an hour? Well, there's a real balance here because I could do it at those much higher speeds to get a bigger representative CDA difference. It all comes down to fatigue. To get consistent results, I've done 10 laps on each bike, which is 20K on each bike. Could I hold that wattage and that body position without changing my body position at 45 or 50K an hour? Absolutely not. I'm not Filippo Ganna. So I have to pick on balance the best aero test speed to get consistent results. I could go out there and do you know 10 laps at 45K an hour, no problem. But, and I have tested this, chances are my body position is gonna fatigue and change too much to get a consistent CDA. So you have to take a balance between resolution and how well you can hold that position to get that constant, reliable, consistent CDA figure. So 35 Ks an hour, or 35 to 40 I reckon is around the sweet spot for me. Anything more than 40 Ks an hour, every lap I can see massive variation in my CDA. So that tells me that I'm moving around a bit, my elbows are moving out, my head's dipping down when I get a bit tired. So. And we can, we can extrapolate that up to 50 k's an hour, but that's using the power of drag equation, which is slightly different from actually doing the test at 50 k's an hour, because as your airspeed increases, the Reynolds number changes and the CDA regime does change. Anyway, those are the results. I started this testing in the end of summer. It's now, you know, December, so. <laughs> the unfortunate thing is, I'm still wearing the same summer kit as when I started the testing, because I want to keep everything consistent, so I'm still wearing short. So at some point, <laughs> I have to change and, you know, put some longer clothes on. But, uh, yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this. 
leave any comments, questions or suggestions you've got down below. Cheers, see you in the next one.